welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk featuring Christopher Swan in conversation with Jocelyn Jackson for a discussion of his new novel, Never Turn Back. I'm Kate Whitman, Vice President of Author Programs and Community Engagement for the History Center, and I'm glad you're joining us this evening. You can purchase copies, signed copies actually, of Never Turn Back from Acapella Books at the link in the chat to the right of your screen. It's also at the link provided at the History Center's website. As Christopher and Jocelyn are talking, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. Jocelyn will get to as many of them as time allows. And now to introduce our authors. Christopher Swan is a novelist and teacher in Atlanta. He earned his PhD in creative writing from Georgia State University. In 2018, Chris was a Townsend Prize finalist, a finalist for Georgia Author of the Year Award, and long listed for the Southern Book Prize with his debut novel, Shadow of the Lions. He lives with his wife and two sons in Atlanta, where he's the English department chair at Holy Innocence Episcopal School. Jocelyn Jackson is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of nine novels, including Gods in Alabama, The Almost Sisters, and Never Have I Ever. She lives in Decatur, Georgia with her husband and their two kids. She serves on the board of and volunteers for performing arts, teaching creative writing inside Lee Arundel State Prison, Georgia's maximum security facility for women. She's also an award-winning audiobook narrator, performing most of her own books, as well as other authors' books. Thank you both for being here. Jocelyn, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Kate. It's always good to see you. I love doing events with the History Center. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to have Christopher Swan here with me tonight, and I want this to be a very interactive experience. Like, if I, I have a whole list of questions to ask Christopher, but your questions are going to be more interesting. And so if you hit that question and answer function right at the bottom and put the question in, I'll get to them as soon as I can. Um, Christopher, let's start with like a softball pitch. Tell us about the book. What's the book about? Well, thanks to the Atlanta History Center for having me here. Thank you, Jocelyn. Appreciate it. And Kate for the introduction. So never turn back. Um, set here in Atlanta, domestic thriller. A uh, young man, Ethan Faulkner, seems to have a pretty good thing going. He's a beloved English teacher at a local private school, um, has a relationship blossoming. And it seems kind of remarkable given the fact that 10 years earlier, Ethan and his sister, little sister Susanna were tragically and violently orphaned. Uh, had to go live with their uncle Gavin, who Ethan finds out is more than a little shady. And he's turned his back and all that and trying to get on with his life. Uh, but his father, one of the last things his father told him was to watch out for his sister. And his little sister, Susanna, is he's probably the most interesting character I've ever written. And she doesn't really want to be taken care of. She shows up in Ethan's doorstep, trouble follows. And Ethan's got to deal with that and also finally face his past. So that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, it's um, it, it's a fantastic book. I got to read it early and I wrote a blurb for it. I just loved it. I thought the whole thing was a roller coaster ride. I do want to tell you guys that this is a keeper shelf book. You're going to want this book. And when you hit the link in the chat window and buy it from Acapella Books, you're not just going to get a great book with a signed book plate that Christopher will take care of. You're also going to be supporting one of Atlanta's flagship indies. Acapella Books has been around forever. They're a community hub and we're in the middle of a pandemic. So please go ahead and hit that link. I know you're going to get a copy, but get it from Acapella. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this main character, a teacher, you say, oh. at a private school, you say. <laughs> um, so this is a guy that you have a little bit in common with. I do. I hope that I'm uh, a little bit more put together than he is. Um, I tend to, I like to write about characters who uh, are imperfect and make mistakes and then try to fix them. And maybe their heart's in the right place, but they don't know how to do that. Well, they don't know how to do it well. Um, but yeah, I draw on that world, but I, uh, he's not me. Like Christopher Walken, I saw an interview with him a while ago and, and somebody said, how do you do all these characters? And he said, all of them are a little bit kind of me. I mean, I'm the only, everything filters through me. 
because obviously I act and I learn things and I'm not, I'm not just playing myself, but everything's a little bit me. And so when I write characters, I just have to be kind of aware of that. Um, but then I write, I try to write about characters and think about who I am. Okay. I got a character who's the opposite of me. So what would the opposite of me do here? Um, but yeah, Ethan, Ethan was familiar, but I, I damaged him. Cause that's what we do. You're so mean. We all have to be mean. It's in the job description. Um, yeah, no, I always say like, none of my characters are me, but they're all mine. Yeah. 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 That's a good way to be there. You know, they show up in your head and sometimes they, uh, they have wills of their own. I've talked about this before and I think people think I'm insane, but, uh, like I wrote Susanna a certain way and she went, no, and did something else. And I'm like, I know it sounds like I'm crazy, but she did, she refused to do what I thought she was going to do in the scene. And I, I'm smart enough at this point, I think to say, all right, I'll let you do what you want to do. And she made the story better because of it. I really believe that's true. And I know it does sound super woo woo, but it's really a very concrete, normal thing. Experientially, it feels really normal to have your characters have wills of their own. And I kind of think that like, the more you fight them, the worse your book is. And when you listen and let them do the thing that's making you uncomfortable, that's when you're getting to the book that you wanted to write in the first place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if you're not, uh, I outline better than I used to, but the outline's a guide. And if a character's going to do something else, I'm like, oh no, I said by page 50, you'd be doing that. Like, mm -hmm, no, just ditch the outline and follow the character. I can always go change it later if I need to, but yeah, you gotta follow, you gotta follow the character because, you know, plots are great. And I love stories that have things that happen, but there's only so many of those plots and every human being is unique. So the character, characters are why people really like to read, I think. Uh, they're what, they wanna follow the character and hope the character wins or hope that character loses or whatever. So yeah, you, you, you have to follow the character as the author and figure out, okay, what's, I know what I want their story to be, but what's going on with them? Yeah, I, I, I'm one of the things I really loved best about this book was that, especially the brother and the sister pair, Ethan and Susanna, I found them to be so layered and so believable. And I, I wonder, like, I'm sorry to keep bringing it back to your life, but I think people are always interested in this. Do you have siblings? I do. I have a younger brother. He, Andrew, he is uh, almost eight years younger than I am. Um, he's not like Ethan and he's not like Susanna. Uh, no, nobody's like Susanna. She's, not, she's my favorite character. I was interested to hear that she's the one that was like getting away from you and doing what she wanted because that's very like her. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the two of them and their relationship. I, I, that's my favorite relationship in the, and there's a great, there's a great love story, depending on how you want to define that. But there's also this brother sister relationship, which was the most interesting thing in the book to me. So talk a little bit about the two of them and they're a little bit contentious with each other. And they are actually, I've got a passage I wanted to read. It's that's right from the beginning of the book. Um, I was joking earlier because sometimes, sometimes writers are like, I'm now going to read from my book. And then some people go, because we've all, we've all listened to authors who are fantastic on the page. And then they, they read like this because public reading is not their thing. And so I teach high school for a living. So I have to get a bunch of teenagers to listen to what I have to say. And hopefully they find it interesting. And all y'all here, you chose to be here. So I'm already winning. Um, but this is right from the, this is right at the beginning of the book where Ethan has come home after uh, a conference where he has, you know, he's just done the walk of shame. He's come home the last day of the conference because he spent the night with a conference attendee. Uh, he hooked up and now he's coming home and he finds his younger sister in his house, totally unexpected. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad to see my sister. It's just that her sudden reappearances can be jarring. She operates on her own timetable, rarely calls or emails, and disappears for months at a time. So seeing Susanna in the flesh is really the only confirmation I ever get that she's even alive. Whenever I would complain about something Susanna had done, like 
taking my books from my bedroom without asking, or eating the last pack of peanut butter crackers in the pantry. Mom would commiserate, but she always ended those talks the same way. I know it's hard having a little sister, she would say in her Irish lilt, but she's your little sister, Ethan. She's the only one you've got. This was a refrain both of my parents often used to impress upon me the importance of being Susanna's big brother, the unique role I was to play in her life. But once she was old enough to ride a tricycle, Susanna came to feel insulted by the idea that she could possibly need me to protect her. I was inclined to agree. People who messed with Susanna were more likely to need me to protect them from her. When I was 12 and Susanna was nine, a budding bully in our neighborhood named Jake called my curly haired sister Brillo Head. The next day, Jake was riding his bike, a red diamondback octane, when the brakes failed to work and he crashed into a utility pole, breaking his forearm and collarbone. When Jake's little brother told the rest of us in the cul-de-sac about Jake's accident, I looked at Susanna. She gave me a ghost of a smile only I could see. More chilling than that smile was the pair of needle nose pliers I found sitting on my dresser that evening, the perfect tool for snipping a brake line on a bike. I put the pliers back where they belonged in the toolbox in our garage and said nothing, partly because I couldn't prove anything, but also because I didn't want to upset mom and dad. Mom because she would cry, dad because I didn't know how he would react. A year after the bike incident, we were orphans. So that's a little summation of what they're like. I love the voice. He is so, uh, his, he, it's very conversational, but it's also very guided. Like it never gets rambly. Um, I, I don't remember. I read your first book. I really liked it, but I don't remember. Was it first person or third person? Mm -hmm. It was first person too. And so is, so you are a very character driven writer. How much of what you do comes out of the idea of creating this voice? Cause they're very different people. Like I think of that prep school guy who's like digging deep into his past. And this book is more um, immediate and set mm -hmm. in the present. Although the, there's a, there's a little bit of family history thing that comes in. Like you see that sort of Irish criminality genetically appearing in Susanna, but, um, but what is that? Are you a, do you consider yourself a voice writer? Um, I don't know, but I think the, I wanted to make, I wanted to make Ethan uh, never turn back different from Matthias, the narrator and protagonist in Shadow of the Lions, because they are both teachers, but with, uh, Matthias is turning, he, he digs back into his past and he has to go back to his past to teach at the school where he went and he lost his roommate. He and his roommate get in an argument, his roommate runs off when they're seniors in high school and vanishes. Like no one finds him. Police, FBI, nobody. And 10 years later, he goes back there to teach, learns something about uh, his friend Fritz has disappeared and decides to dig. Um, Never Turn Back's different in that Ethan's a character who's he doesn't want to turn back to his past. There's a title. He's like, I don't know. Um, oh, so he's trying to, he's ignoring that. But then here comes Susanna and he has these memories and he blocks his memories away and tries not to listen to them. So I, I deliberately tried to make him a little different. And the, the whole teacher gig, there's, there's less about him being a teacher uh, than there was about Matthias in the first book. Yeah, no, they're very different guys, and the voices are very different. I did and that. I, yeah. What? I did that deliberately, sorry. I, I wanted to make it, because I realized, like, I got another teacher guy, sort of, uh, but gave him different situations and tried to make them, okay, I got my life together. It's okay. Yeah. Well, if you have not read Shadow of the Lions, um, I'm willing to bet Acapella can hook you up with that one, too. But here we're talking about Never Turn Back. And if you look in the chat, there is a link to Acapella Bookstore. You should click on that and go ahead and get a copy. And also, sign books, best Christmas present in the world. And this is a propulsive thriller that a lot of people on your list would really like. Just saying. Thank so, you. So, is this the beginning of a series? 
Um, it, it didn't start that way. Um, whenever, whenever it shadow, people said, so what, are you going to write a book, a follow-up? I'm like, no, I'm done with, why? I, I was done with them. Like I wrote, um, but people want to know what happened afterwards. Uh, and then I wrote this and after Never Turn Back, after I finished writing Never Turn Back, um, I miss these characters, uh, especially Susanna. And so <laughs> I was talking with, uh, I'm friends with Brian Panowich is another Georgia writer. He's a friend of mine. He's like, dude, you've got to write a Susie book. Uh, and at first it, it took me a minute. I'm like, what's a Susie book? Like, I didn't know what he meant. I was like, oh, you mean, I'm like, well, what would I, and we, we talked about it some, and I'd had an idea in the back of my head, um, but that just sort of, he just fanned the flame. So yeah, the. Where were you in the writing process? Had you finished the book when that happened? Um, or were you still yeah, yeah, I think I was doing, yeah, I think I'd finished and then, no, I w I'd finished the first draft and I was shopping it around and I, and I was going to do, it's like, I want to write a sequel. And my wife, Kathy, who's the, you know, much more practical said, why don't we see if we sell this first? <laughs> Which made sense. You don't want to write, write a sequel to a book that uh, let's say nobody was interested in. Um, the, I've, I've turned in a third book to my editor which is completely different. Um, but once that's done, the next thing I'm working on, I've already got the first two, two chapters done is a sequel to this. Uh, I tried, somebody told me a long time ago, I'm trying to remember who, if, you, if you're gonna write a series uh, and they'd wish they'd known this earlier, make sure they can all stand alone. Um, yeah, I agree with that entirely. Um, so Kate is reminding you in the chat right now that you can get in on this conversation. I mean, I've known Chris Berg for quite a while. He and I can talk crap all night if that's what you wanna do, but it's a lot more fun if you actually get involved and become part of the conversation. So just hit the little question and answer button at the bottom and put your questions in and I will make sure that Mr. Swan hears them and we will talk about, I mean, we wanna talk about writer stuff. We, we'd love it if we were talking about the stuff that you wanna talk about. Um, so you've written, I guess, two standalones and one book that you thought would be a standalone, but this is now a series. Like, have you started the second book in the series? And is it, is it different because there are like, I, I'm, I think about world building, like in some ways it must be very comfortable to slip back into this created space that you know. Well, I said it here in Atlanta and um, and I've lived here on and off, except for one bout of grad school um, since 1988 and, uh, and seen the city grow and I explode. And it's, it's a crazy place. Uh, I live in, in, in Ethan and his sister grew up in Sandy Springs where I live. I live near Chastain Park. Um, and it's a nice suburban area north of Atlanta. I mean, literally right north of Buckhead. Um, you go 10 miles south of here, you know, and you're in English Avenue in Vine City, just west of downtown. And um, 10 years ago, you know, that was one of the most, that was the most dangerous, quote unquote, neighborhood in Atlanta, one of the uh, top five in the country. And there's since been a whole lot of uh, renovation and rebuilding and lots of programs going on down there. But it's, it's, that's not far. Most American cities are like that. Um, and one thing I like about this city is it's so different. It's got so many different neighborhoods and they all have their own flavor. Um, and writing a crime novel, you get to explore that. Crime, crime stories are great ways to do that. Um, so it's, it's fun doing that and then having, but it's more about the characters. I've gotten grounded in the city that I know and I'm learning a lot more about every day. But uh, yeah, I like, I like these guys and the relationships that they've, they've built with each other. Um, not just Ethan and Susie, but uh, their friends and, the, and Uncle Gavin even, so. Uh, he's definitely a character. A um, so we are getting some questions from people now. And uh, Laura wants to know, because we're talking about setting and it being in Atlanta, do you consider yourself 
to be a Southern writer. Yes, I, I used to have a more qualified answer to that. And I think it's because um, when I was younger and, and knew everything, it's like, no, I'm a writer, you know, Southern is just, hap I just happen to live in the South. Well, I think that's, you know, I also had a, a vision. I think some people think Southern writer, that means, oh, you must have magnolia trees and everyone's drinking mint juleps and no. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is where, this is where I'm from and where I've essentially lived all my life. Uh, I was in grad school in Missouri for three years and some people in Missouri would say, we're Southern too. And I was like, maybe. Um, but yeah, and I, I, but I think that, I don't think that that limits you to what you write about. I think it just, uh, it colors what you write about. You have a different take on you know, history. I mean, I, I named my character Ethan Faulkner. The last name is not a mistake. Yeah. Even it's teased about it. And I use the William Faulkner quote in, in here, you know, the, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. Um, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of thing that I think of as, as being Southern. And I, 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 was, I loved Pat Conroy and loved reading his books. And they're very Southern, but they're also, they're not just they're so, universal. Yeah. You don't have to be from the South to get them or to read them. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't know if, I definitely think that, like, I think that actually is better. Like, I think one, if, to be unsouthern and enter into that world, I like to read books set in England. I like to read books set in Africa. Like, there's some, there's an armchair travel aspect where if you live in the West or up the East Coast pretty far, it's a way to enter into another culture. And I think that that flavor really bring something to the book I agree. Especially with the Irish connection I mean I'm I'm Irish we mm -hmm. I am I am potato famine <laughs> descended Irish person so and, and the south is full of us right I was you know because you think oh it's all Boston New York You're like the after Boston you go to Savannah if you want you know St. Patrick's Day per I mean that's that's the large and it it's enormous, it's huge. Um, and I've, <laughs> yeah, the very first novel I wrote, which is under my bed and is gonna stay there. Uh, it was part, yeah, it was, uh, part of it was set in Ireland. Um, oh, really? Yeah, and <laughs> third rate Pat Conroy wannabe, me, writing about a father son fisherman family that go at it like this. Uh, they live on the Georgia coast. The mother's just died of cancer. Uh, the IRA is involved. Your reaction is exactly the reaction that I got from New York when I sent it out. Um, they're like, this doesn't make sense. Well, it made perfect sense to me, but it, no. But I, I also, like, if you hadn't writ written that, would you have been able to write? Like, you learn how to write a novel by writing a novel. So I, I, don't, need, I don't think any of those under the bed books are ever wasted. No, I thought it was at the time, but no, I totally, I learned, I learned what not to do. I realized, okay, I can write a book length narrative. I wrote some scenes I'm proud of and I can repurpose them. And I took, uh, you know, Uncle Gavin was sort of a character in there and I repurposed him and some of the things from that book, but yeah, you know, I didn't well, like it. Never dead. <laughs> I always be pulled out from under the bed and put in the next book. Um, we're talking about never turn back with, um, Christopher Swan. And if you look in the chat, there is a link where you can purchase your very own copy signed from one of our local independents, um, acapella books that we all want to support. So you should go ahead and do that. If you know you want to make it happen. Um, Carrie Dunn wants to know how your students react or handle your author status. Is it cool for them to have? Uh, it, I'm laughing because I have a, um, I have a poster size uh, picture of uh, my first book, Chat of the Lions, up in my room because I got it when I went to a reader event. I'm like, I have nowhere. And they gave it to me afterwards. And um, I was like, what do, I, what do I do with this? So I stuck it in my classroom, which sounds really obnoxious, but I stuck it behind the door. So you don't, it's, not like, it's not like enter my classroom, look at me. Because the last thing I want to be is like, well, you know, when I write my novel, like I have no interest in, in doing that. Um, but 
it was really it was something that was really cute was I, I we have a bookstore at the school at teach at holy innocence and i was at the bookstore i did a signing and so i'm sitting at this table and, and one of my freshman students comes like comes in and does a double take and sees me and sees a little sign that says you know author and looks at the book and looks at me she picks it up looks at me again and looks did you write this I did and she said where 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 could I buy one like you could buy one anywhere like and she's like really because they charge a whole lot for things in this store <laughs> I start laughing um, but it was it was that it, it was completely guileless and she wasn't trying to to yank my chain or anything uh, it was really sweet um, they I don't make it I don't make a deal about it and they don't um every once in a while they're like did you write a book and so I was like oh yeah my mom read it it was great or, or whatever usually uh, or they, if they didn't like it they at least lie and say yeah my mom loved it or my dad was you know really enjoyed it so it's nice some of them um it's after they graduate they're like dude I read this this was great thank you you know are you writing another one so that's that's a lot of fun um but then the same the guy that's grading their papers and saying, yeah, it's a comma splice. Don't do that. So they, if, if they have any sort of, I don't think there's any sort of uh, holding me up on a pedestal. I'm the guy that's still grading their papers and uh, teaching them Shakespeare. So that's, um, that sounds about right. Are your, is your, my children are, I guess they're just used to it. They're completely unimpressed with <laughs> It's just normal. Mom has another book out. We have to go to the launch and like wash our hair and look nice. Um, are, are yours that way or are they more excited about it? They're, they're excited about it. my uh, My younger one, Sullivan, he's 13. He, he posted on, he came in here and took a picture of my book right at the right. end of Instagram and said, you know, oh, look, my dad wrote another book. Congrats. Another book. Every time and I turn around. Put, like a smiley face or something in there. Um, That's awesome. Uh, yeah, and my my older son, he he he's uh, my first book. He took uh, he was, he took to school. They're like, okay, and you had some outside reading, uh, and he took my book to be his outside reading. And his his English teacher took a picture of it and sent it to me. It was they they're they're great. That is like, great. Are you, like, are you doing another thing tonight? Are you and oh god, so I can't come in the library. Oh, fine, I'll take your dog. I mean, yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, so I, I, I have to ask you about the audio version. This is one of the questions that's coming from the audience, but this is a really cool story. Talk about that because it's, first of all, it's really cool. You sold audio rights and yeah. the audio version is by all accounts. Fantastic. I read it with my eyes, but the people who've read it with their ears have loved it. It's supposedly it has a great reader. Tell me about that. So um, the most, the most surreal thing I, I ever had to do was when the, when the first book came out, they, uh, my editor said, hey, we've got to figure out who, who's going to be your reader. I'm like, for what? For an audiobook? And so I had to listen to two different, it was like two different guys auditioned and read the beginning of my book. And so I'm sitting in my classroom in a free period listening to that, which is, again, the most surreal thing that had ever happened to me. So when Never Turn Back was coming out, I said, okay, we're going to have an audiobook version. Um, but here are some, and we're going with this company. Dreamscape, and here are some authors. Wh what do you think? And I listen. I was like, well, okay, good. No, that's all right. Nothing, nothing clicked. It didn't sound okay. like him to you, huh? It just no. didn't sound like him to you. No, it, it, it when and I, it wasn't anybody reading from from my book. I was, I had to go like listen to them reading from other stories. So that might have colored it too. Um, and my and Kathy, my wife said, what about Axe? And I smacked my head. Axe Norman is, uh, he's, he's read about a hundred and I think it's about 140, 160 books. If you've ever been to the Empire State Building and taken the audio tour, it's his voice. Um, and uh, we were classmates in college. And so I reached out to him and he said, I'm, I'm flattered. I don't, I don't really do voices. I'm a narrator. He said, but if you're going to trust your book to me, I want to give it extra special care. And I said, I have no idea how this works. Could you do something with dreamscape? I'm just, 
and, and, and it worked out. And so, yeah, my college classmate is uh, the narrator for Never Turn Back. And I, the long sample that I heard uh, they sent to me, it sounded fantastic. And yeah, I've heard the same thing. So it was, it was really cool to have somebody I know personally who's a, who's a great actor and a great guy all around and mm -hmm. a total pro. Yeah, he nailed it. Um, I think that's really cool. If you want the print version, go ahead, open the chat, hit the link, and buy it from Acapella Support Your Local Indie. And you will get a signed copy from Christopher. And don't forget to put your questions into the question box. We're doing those now. Um, we have the, the, this is interesting to me as a person, as a woman, the, the, I always get, how do you find time to raise children and write a book? You're getting, how do you find time to write and teach? <laughs> Even when I had a full-time job, I was always, it's just, it's just weird. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm not saying anything against Colin who's asking that. It's a great question because if you have more than one thing that you're doing, how do you balance that? Um, I'm lucky enough to work in a great school that has been very, uh, very supportive of my writing habit um, and, you know, promoted me and everything. And so I've always felt supported and always felt like, okay, I have, it's okay for me to go write. Uh, I don't write during school day or anything like that. I'm, I'm teaching full time when I'm there. But uh, I've done this for a while, so I'm able to, and I'm working in an independent school, I don't have um, the kind of class size that uh, some cousins who teach public school in North Carolina, they got 130 kids and I've got 49. Wow. Um, kind of thing. Um, and we don't have many duties and outside of class. And uh, I tend to have my summers open. So my summers are when I get a whole lot done. Um, so I figured out how to do, I, I don't, I don't get up every morning. I tried to do that for a while. Let me get up at four 30 and write for a couple hours. By the time the coffee kicks in and I'm away, I'm like, Oh, and now it's, now it's time to go to work. Um, so I think once my kids were born, I became more of a night owl. So I will, uh, you know, I just sort of gave up and watching TV, which doesn't hurt. I mean, we'll watch some things, but, I don't have to worry about it. You know, we'll watch it some other time or watch it some weekend uh, and try to write when I can. Like I said, and it helps that your wife is a writer too. Like you both create that time, that room for each other to work. Yes. Like I think that's really, I'm, I, yeah, I think y'all are a really cool couple in that way. And the way that you're so supportive of each other's work and you create space and time for each other to work. That's, I think, really challenging with two writers in the house. And yet I don't know I'm another couple who does it better. Maybe as good, uh, but not better. <laughs> we, we write, and we write very different things, which is, and I think if we both wrote crime fiction or if we were both writing, you know, romance novels or whatever genre, I think then, yeah, it's something I've learned, you know, I learned getting into this world and, you know, meeting people like you, meeting other great authors that, this while there are jerks out there and i don't think i've met i haven't really interacted with them in the publishing world yet knock on wood but everyone's so supportive and generous it's not like a zero-sum game it's not like god jocelyn's got a book out you know great like people buy more than one book like you know yay buy her book buy my book um and that's true. If you had just have the one, by the time you're going through it the fifth time, it's just lo has lost the ability to surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's like a white, it's like a, a ton of French. I love her, her newest book, The Searcher, just came out. Yeah. Same thing, my book dropped. And I was like, oh, you know, for a second, I was like, oh, great. Right. Um, like I'm in competition with ton of like, but. Yeah, I feel like you'll both be okay. I think I think it's going to be all right. Um, but no, it's it's like I say, yeah, people buy more than one book, uh, and again, people have been so kind and generous and supportive. And I think it's because most writers are like, look, I get it, I've been there, and many are like, we're still there. You know, we wrote a we wrote a book, maybe we've had success with it, and that's nice, but it doesn't mean a whole lot when you sit down and you're working on book number two or book number 10 or whatever, you're still, okay, can I predict, can I write a story that people want to read? You have to sit down and face that, that, that blank. 
Paige again. Um, so I'm going to combine some things that a bunch of people are saying. There's at least three comments saying, I love Susie. I crave more Susie. Susanna, Susie Faulkner rules the earth. Uh, and then I'm, so this is a character that people are really responding to. I know she figures very largely in the sequel, which we're a, a, a little ways away from, but I'm wondering, we also have another person who we've kind of touched on this before, but they want to talk more about writing in the first person. When you write the Susie Faulkner book, are you going to stay in first person? Yeah. You, you think so? Yeah, it's going to be from her point of view. And you can, uh, do you have that voice in your head? Like, can you hear her? Yes. That's I've, really cool. I mean, I've been surrounded by strong women my whole life. My mother, Kathy, um, cousins, uh, just so I've heard, and, and they're not, you know, I'm not comparing them to Susie because Su Susie's, Susie's fantastic, but she's broken. Um, All the best ones. Um, yeah, she's great. I know. Well, I mean, she, if everything's perfect, then yeah, I wanted to, uh, she kicks ass and takes names, but she's not, I also wanted to make sure, I wanted to make her. Oh, she's so likable. I wanted to make her, but also I wanted to make her a woman. I didn't want to, she can hang with the boys, but she's a woman. Yeah. She's not, you know, I didn't no, want to. I found her to be super, I mean, she's super broken, but she's also really, um, she's not accessible. That's not the right word, but she's super, like, you have so much empathy for her as a reader. And I found her to be a very realistic layered woman. I really love her. She's probably my favorite character in the book. No offense to Ethan, who I followed for a whole novel joyfully, but to me, she, you know, he was sort of the legs and the lungs. She was kind of the heart. Yeah. And I, uh, I was, tr I was really careful trying to make her a strong female character because it's been, like my first book was set in all boys boarding school. Mm -hmm. And there were, I think two female characters in that book. Um, one was the main character's mom, who's a minor character, but she's pretty likable. And the other one was uh, the missing friend's sister, and Abby. And I tried to make her as strong as I could because she was competing with a whole lot of male voices. And in this book, I've got a lot of male characters too, but I've got two, two pretty strong female characters. Very different. Very different. Broken in very different ways. <laughs> Yes. And, uh, and I wanted to make them, I, I wanted to not make them stereotypical. And I didn't want Susie to, um, you know, I didn't want her to be uh, like, she's like a boy, but she has breasts. You know, like right. as, a, as, as somebody somewhere was like, oh, okay, this is like a, this character in some other book was like, it's like a boy with boobs. Excuse me. But that, and I, and I laughed at that almost, I thought, no, I know what you mean. Like we just you made her just like you made this one character just like a guy, except that she's a girl. And I tried to make I tried to make Susie her own thing. And uh, it, it always makes me think of that old what's that old movie with Jack Nicholson as the author where he says somebody asks him how he writes such realistic women characters, and he's like, I think of a man, and then I take away reason and accountability. <laughs> It's just so horrifying. And, and I had boobs, he did not say, but he should have. Um, because I have seen that before, but I, and I, I, I read mostly women, um, and I found Susie to be so layered and so relatable and so, I can't wait to read another book with her in it. Um, well, we are winding down. We're almost out of time. I think we've gotten to most of the questions. If you have a question, this is like your last chance to get it in. I have one more question for Christopher, and then we'll check and make sure we've gotten them all, and then we'll call it a night. So let me just remind you one more time, open the chat. This is, Click that link, support your local independent bookstore acapella, and get a great signed book to give to somebody for Christmas. You can do that thing where you kind of open it carefully and read the book and then you have this great sign book for a Christmas present. That's naughty, but I, I would never do that. Mm. But, um, but you should. So I want to just talk to you about being a person who writes about crime and writes these sort of thriller. And, and there's a huge audience for this. Like we seem to be fascinated with this. Why do you write about it? Why do people read about it? What's the deal with that, Christopher Swan? Um, everybody, everybody, 
good. I think we've got a strange relationship with crime in America. Like nobody wants to be a victim of crime and no one wants crime in their neighborhood. And yet we sort of mythologize it, you know, in our movies and our books. Um, I mean, heck, our country exists because, well, Great Britain thought that we were criminals. You know, we're like, no, we have, no thanks. We're having our own country. You know, they sent troops over to stop us. Thankfully, it didn't happen. Um, but uh, crime's a violation whenever there's any kind of a crime. And, and there's different levels, obviously. When that happens, people want to see order restored. And whether it's going to be like a law enforcement officer or a private investigator or a civilian, right? Um, a crime is a great way to talk about anything. It, reveal, it, it puts your characters under pressure. Uh, it reveals a lot about characters. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I was, when I was in college, uh, I drove a Suzuki Samurai. You remember those? They're like these ah. tall, narrow Jeeps. Um, and it had a soft top. And I got in, you know, one morning I, I got up and I had to drive to campus to go to class. So I got in my car, started it, and, and went to turn on the stereo. And my hand went right through a hole in my dash. And I looked down, and there's a hole where my car stereo had been, and wire sticking out. Someone had sliced open the soft top and climbed in and stolen it. I was outraged. Like my car had been parked, safe and surrounded by the cars right up against the house where I live. I drove to the police station. Jocelyn, I filed a report. And part of me thought, and there's, there's no one who's more self-confident or arrogant than a college sophomore. And I, I was like, they, you were, I, I walked in and the police officer was you know, took the thing. Part of me was thinking that he was going to say something like, oh yeah, sounds like George. Like George is the town near do well. Me and the boys will look in on him. And that later he would lead a SWAT team into George's apartment and kick down the door and he'd catch George red handed at the kitchen table with my car stereo and I'd get it back and he'd go to jail. And at the same- He would be sorry. Yeah, it would be. And I'd get like a commendation from the mayor or whatever. And most of me was thinking, I'm never going to see the car stereo again. And I didn't. And I called my parents. I was upset about it. My dad said, it's okay. Why don't we, let's go. You're fine. Is the car okay? Why don't we, you know, go look for another one. We can replace it. And that tells you a lot too. For me, it was like a inconvenience. And for what I thought was not very much money, I went and got another stereo. And it was probably better than the one that came with the car. Um, but for somebody else, that could be devastating. You know, I had an extra $150, $200. You know, my family did that we could spend on that. Not everybody does. Crime can do that. can show you a lot about the characters who suffer from the crime um, and the people who commit them. And there's, a, uh, there's an author I love, a guy named Martin Cruz Smith. He wrote Gorky Park. Oh, yeah. I read that. In the whole series, he wrote a whole series of the same main character, Arkady Renko. He's a homicide investigator in Moscow in the Soviet Union, and then later in post-Soviet Russia. And in one of the novels, he, it's actually right before the Soviet Union falls, um, he's talking to some expat Russians. They're like, you're a policeman in a police state. Like, why, why do you do this? And he thinks about it, and he says, permission. When someone is killed for a short time afterwards, people have to answer questions. An investigator gets to investigate and explore and you see how the world is built. A murder is a little like a house split in half. You get to see what floor is beneath what floor and what door leads to another door. And I thought that was a great comparison because when you have crime, somebody goes to explore, let me find, let me figure out what's going on. And they always find answers, but they might find the answers they weren't looking for. They always uncover something. And that's, that's red meat to a writer, at least to me, right? I mean, you get uh, people poke around and people's secrets, you know, people don't like that. Um, and so you might find answers to the question you were trying to solve, but you're gonna find other things too. What are you gonna do with that? So it just creates a whole great moral uh, moral story for the characters. You automatically get a great plot, and everybody everybody likes to see. Right? Like, is the crime? You know, is the bad guy really bad? Is the crime bad enough? We're going to see the bad guy punished. Uh, you know, maybe. Maybe. Got to.
Christopher Swan, author of Shadow of the Lions, who has completely avoided the sophomore slump that all writers bear by delivering a fantastic book, Never Turn Back, that you can order right now from acapella. Thank you for spending this time with me in the Atlanta History Center and all of these readers. Thank you for the book and thank you for your time. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. I'm going to spend, I'm going to do 60 seconds evangelizing for indie bookstores. Do it. Go. Uh, these, these places, these are not just marketplaces. They're like, they're, they're temples and they've been hurt. Like every, everything else has been hurt by this pandemic, but indie bookstores, especially they thrive in community and community is now thrown on, well, this, we're doing this right now. Um, I, when I, I was in a independent bookstore, Park Road Books in Charlotte, uh, on tour a few years ago. I got there early. I'm walking around the aisle, in the aisles, slipping at the books. Customer comes in, goes to a bookseller, says, yeah, I'm looking for something like Gone Girl, but a little less dark and with characters I might actually like. And I start laughing because I've read Gone Girl. And I, would, I, I know it was very propulsive. And at the end of it, I'm like, I hate all these characters. Um, and the bookseller didn't miss a, didn't, didn't bat an eye. She said, okay, I've got three suggestions for you. Come on. I thought that's why we need these guys. You know, they know books um, and they will bend over backwards to get the books to you. And they provide a great service, not just for authors and for writer and writers, uh, but for readers. Um, so if you can, I'd love everybody to buy a copy of my book, but if you don't buy one of mine, you know, please buy something sometime soon even if it's a gift card from an indie bookstore, uh, that will, it will, it will make my day and it'll make yours and it'll definitely make theirs. So. And it'll make our city and our country better. If at the end of this, we all can leave our houses. We still have our bookstores. They make us better. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Good night, everybody. Thank you.